Today you join me at the iconic Woodsboro Reservoir, a venue that's steeped in history, held some massive events over the years, and I'd say in the last two or three years has become a very fashionable venue to visit. Now it's cold today, we're just coming out of winter, water's ice cold, the venue is low. Obviously they've been doing some work on the reservoir, so it's quite low, we've not got a lot of depth. But what I'm gonna be talking you through today is my approach to cold water skimmer fishing on the feeder. So I'm gonna talk you through tackle choice, like why, hook sizes, feeder sizes, why I'm using what feeders, bait, how to feed your swim, plus how to make a bite or two when all else fails. So first things first, on a big water like this, where'd you start? Got a little bit of local info, levels down, as I've already said, uh, slightly deeper this end. So my personal opinion is still really cold. Those skimmers are gonna to wanna to be in slightly deeper water. And when I say slightly deeper, I'm talking like, I don't think I'm chucking into more than five foot. Obviously when it's full, you're probably talking, talking I don't know, eight to 10 foot. So today we're chucking into sort of five foot of water and it's pretty much that depth as far as I can throw. I've had a good plumb around using braid. It's important to mention braid as in when you're plumbing up because it allows me to get an accurate feel of the bottom. I don't want to be chucking on like an uneven bottom, etc. So I found a nice spot 40 meters out on a one ounce bomb. When I've gone to plumb it, I can't get a count, but I found ounces heavy enough for me to sort of drag it along, get a feel of what's there. So to sort of get an idea of depth, I've then put a two thirds of an ounce bomb on just to get a count. And what I found is as I go to the left of the swim, it's getting shallower. Whereas if I come to the right, I've lined up, there's a big sort of sticking, spiky tree sticking up. Just there, I've got virtually a two count on a two thirds of an ounce bomb, which I reckon is probably five foot of water. And that's as good as it's gonna get. So that's gonna be my, my main line, so to speak. I'm not saying as the day goes on, we might, we might have to move, but when I'm skimmer fishing and I'm not looking for loads of bites, but remember it's cold, I don't believe in sort of splitting my fish. So my idea is put a bit of bait in and then work that spot, maybe work around the spot, but try and just keep picking up a few fish as the day goes on. So that's the plan. Let's see how it goes. Baiting up. Now, one of the biggest decisions you're gonna face in any day's fishing is how much bait you put in. As I've said, the water's absolutely freezing today. And while an aggressive feeding approach might pay off, there's every chance it'll kill the swim before it started. And I'm a massive believer in the age old adage of you can put bait, bait in, but you can't take it out. So I'm gonna put six, six old Guru Exchange bait ups in at the start. Got 30 gram on them. 30 gram for me, strong crosswind but it's enough weight to get me to 40 meters with relatively, relative ease. My tackle for baiting up is also worth talking through. We've got Guru Spod Braid. I've attached my feeder literally with a snap link swivel. I've just literally tied it into a loop, nice and simple. So braid direct, got no leader on it. And then the rod itself is a 12 foot bait up rod, nice stiff tip. And the beauty of having a sort of stiff action tip is when it comes to emptying the feeder, and that's one of the key things about the exchange bait ups is they're tapered in design for, for quick and optimum bait release. Slightly narrower at the top, slightly wider at the bottom. So if you can imagine when you're just basically trying to get that bait out, it's a really clean release and you're emptying all the bait where you want it to go. So what am I gonna put in? Obviously ground bait. I will talk you through exactly what all the baits I'm using are once we've got some bait in, but I think it's important on a day when it could be hard, let's get some bait out and we'll take things from there. So I'm literally gonna put a pinch of casters, a few pellets, a couple of pinkies, not much bait at all. I'm gonna rely on the ground bait for attraction. You might be thinking, why, why not worms? I've got worms on my side tray. I don't honestly know if they work here. And I'm very conscious of the fact, some venues worms are brilliant when the water's cold, others they're like poison. So I'm gonna hold off them to start. If a couple of hours in we're struggling, I might have to introduce them. But literally, I've slightly overwet my ground bait as well. So it's it's what I'd call nice and soft. We're only chucking into five foot of water. So I want the ground bait to sort of spread out and basically cover the bottom. I don't want to leave a really tight sort of area of bait. So let's put the first one in. Plugging it really loose as well. So it will just hold in. What I don't want it to do is sort of be dragged back when I go to empty the feeder. So nice and smooth on the cast. 
got my marker. Basically, let it hit. So that's on the bottom, like literally instantly, because there's very little water to go at. It's going to give it like five seconds just to, just so it hits the bottom and starts to disperse. Then it's a nice quick, like that, because the rod's nice and stiff. I feel that feeder literally empty instantly. So that's one. My plan is, I'm going to put four on the bottom. Same sort of bait in each, little pinch of micros, pinch of casters, couple of pinkies, very little in it. I don't think we're fishing for loads of bites today, but hopefully a decent stamp of fish. So plug it nice and loose again. Nice and smooth on the cast. It's really important to get, try and get this, like, not saying you want to be on a sixpence, but you need to make every cast count when you're baiting up, particularly when it's cold, because you can't be spreading bait all over the swim. So sort of four or five seconds, just to let it hit. Nice and clean. And you can literally, you can feel that feeder empty out. You can see how shallow it is by how quickly that feeder's back on the surface. So I'm going to put four on the bottom. Then I'm going to put two. I'm going to empty two on the surface. Important to be quite... When you go to empty that feeder, be quite firm in your first little strike. Like, it's like two or three little mini strikes. That's why braids are good, because it's got literally no stretch. It allows a really clean release of the feeder. So what I'm going to do with this one is empty it as soon as it hits the surface. So it's literally hit like that, and it's empty. So literally all that's happening there, it's like throwing a really soft ball in on the surface, and it's just literally clouding up the swim. So one more like that. You can't, it's really difficult, I will say, to bait up if your rod's not right for the job. You want that stiff tip that just gives you that bit of power to get a clean empty of the feeder. It's the last one on the surface. So literally, let it hit, and it's empty. Got to be like, it's just that really quick, two or three little mini strikes. You don't want a big whack when you're trying to empty the feeder because you're going to drag your bait. Two or three little like, almost like one foot strikes. Feeder's empty, got that cloud going through and hopefully a few fish will come in. So we're baited up. I'm going to let that swim just sit for half an hour. You know what I mean? If it was a match situation now, because there's some carp in here, I'd probably whack a big hybrid down the middle, try and catch a carp, let that skimmer line settle. I, I'm not a believer when you're fishing for not many bites when it's really cold to bait you up and then going straight on it. So what we're going to do is give it half hour, let that bait settle, and hopefully when we go, go on it, there'll be a few fish there. It's been about 30 minutes since we've baited up now. So before I have that sort of all important first cast, I'm just going to talk you through my bait choices and why. First of all, ground bait. I've gone with Ringer's F1 Black. It's like a sweet fish meal ground bait. So it's sort of 50% pellety fish meal, 50% sort of biscuit. So it's sweet fish meal, nice trade off when the water's cold and you don't want to mix that's too potent. It's also very low in food content. What I want at this time of year is a mix that's got lots of attraction, but not lots of food. So I don't want a mix that's full of big particles. Any particles I put in the mix are ones that I'm going to add throughout the day. I don't want a mix that's got flakes in, big bits of pellet, etc. I want lots of attraction, minimal food content. Other baits, you don't need loads of bait when the water's cold. I've got like literally three quarters of a pint of pellets. They're literally just wetted up. So they're not, I'm not feeding them hard as such where they might float. They've just literally been wetted up, so they're a little bit softer. And I've got a few red maggots, lives for the hook. Some people might say, why not deads? I sort of find that bream and skimmers they hang on to a live maggot better. I feel like in their own, in a bream's head or a skimmer's head, they feel like they have to kill it. So they hang on to it a little bit better. So I've kept them live. And I've got some pinkies. If it's really hard, three pinkies is a good bait or a red maggot and a pinky. But there's, if, if there's nothing out there, I will not have to get a bite on a pinky, but if there are a few small fish out there, pinkies might get me a few bites, and they're just a bait I'd always carry for skimmers. Lastly, we've got casters, uh, more just for a food item. It's going to feed a few casters throughout the day. I can't see me putting one on the hook unless I feel there's a few bream in the swim, and maybe I'm getting a few liners, but they're just an I a food item that might attract an odd bigger fish. So, and again, a big roach, there's supposed to be some really big roach in here. Big roach love a caster. So I'm just going to trickle a few through. You might notice as well, something I've not talked about, I can just pull a few out, got some worms. As I've already mentioned, 
I don't know much about this place. Well, in fact, I don't know anything really about it for this style of fishing. So worms, got them, got my scissors, got my tub. Might chop a few as sort of an impact bait two, three hours in if, if things are really poor. But at the minute, I'm just holding on to them. So that's my bait choice, nice and simple. So now it's time for that all important first chuck. Because I've got no idea sort of what's gonna be out there, I just wanna get a bite first. So hook bait wise, it's gonna put three pinkies on. It's just a really good bait that's caught me a lot of bream and a lot of skimmers over the years. I will talk to you in depth about my setup once we're fishing, but at the minute, I just wanna get out there. So three pinkies, I've got a small 20 gram window. Just gonna put a little bit of bait, same as what I fed in the bait up really, a little bit of bait in it. One scoop through, and then it's loaded like so. Not loading it too hard. Ground bait's what I'd call damp at the minute. It's a case now of sort of feeling my way in. So line up with that marker, hit the clip, rod down. And now it's a case of seeing how quick fish come to that bait. I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not expecting an instant response. I'll expect if it's going to be a good day, I'd expect the first bite after about an hour, but we've started now, so let's see what happens. Well, unbelievably, after me just saying I didn't expect a quick bite, literally 10 seconds after stopping filming, it's pulled a lovely slow bite. It's not a big fish, but it is a fish. It's either a... It's either a big roach or I'd say an 8 to 12 ounce skimmer if I was guessing but a really nice start oh it's a bit closer in than I thought let's have a look what is it oh it's a nice skimmer a bit bigger than I said as well probably a I don't know getting on for a pound so there you go probably just about a pound great start what I'm going to do is see if it was a fluke in other words see if we can get one more then I'll talk you through my setup. Well, we've had four early fish, but the wind's become absolutely horrific and it's absolutely freezing as well. So what I'm gonna do is just talk you through my setup. Starting with rod choice. Rod today, bearing in mind, fishing for skimmers. We're fishing at 40 meters, 12 foot event of Steve Ringer. The best way I can describe the action is you never feel like you're gonna lose a fish. So it's perfect for this type of work, perfect for skimmers, bream, roach, that type of fishing. Quiver tip choice, I've actually set two up. I've set one up with an ounce and one up with an ounce and a half. The reason being, it's windy, but I didn't know what the toe is going to be like. And th there is a bit of toe, but I've been able to fish with the ounce tip so far. Real line, 008 Pulsate braid straight through. So I've got no leader, I'm fishing braid direct. Nice, simple little running rig. Small Guru feeder link, which my feeder attaches to with a little snap link on the bottom. And then I've tied in five inches of eight pound shield single strand now anyone who's watched a lot of my stuff will know i used to use a twizzled loop I used to get an odd tangle with a twizzled loop so what i've done now I've replaced it with a single strand eight pound shield with a loop in it so i can loop loop to loop my hook lengths and the way i tie in that strand of shield is with a four turn water knot trim the knots tight and then my pat, running pat noster just literally i'm casting off the knot in effect it just the knot acts as your buffer what I like about the single strand of shield is very light, minimal resistance when skimmers, roach, etc. are picking up the hook bait. 
there's no weight there, so very little resistance, so the chances of them feeling that something's wrong is reduced. So feeder choice, I'll talk to you about in depth a little bit later on when I talk about what feeder and why. Moving down to hook length, I've started with 65 centimetres O12 pure fluorocarbon. I've gone for fluorocarbon, it's a little bit stiffer, tangles less, and visibility wise, it's more difficult for the fish to see. Then last but not least, hook choice, bearing in mind barbed hooks are allowed here from October onwards, uh, is a size 16 pole special. Brilliant little hook, very suited to natural baits like a bunch of pink ears, single maggot, a caster, or even a wormhead. Stays razor sharp too, which is really important when it's a case of not getting loads of bites and you need every fish to count. So that's my actual setup. I'll get my feeder box and I'll run you through what, what I think about feeder choice and why I'm using what I'm using today. Feeder choice for today. Now, bearing in mind, it's very shallow, it's very windy. There's two things I've got to take into account. One, I need to be accurate, not feeding loads of bait. So I can't afford to be scattering it all over the place. So accuracy is really important. And then two, I need to be able to cast into this wind. That's for me is where the cage windows come in. Basically they're weight forward in design. So obviously it's like if you look all the, all the weights at the bottom of the feeder, but they've still got that important cage. I'm a massive fan of a cage feeder. If you'd have told me, I don't know, five years ago that I'd be fishing windows all the time, I never would have believed you. But at the time, there wasn't what I'd call a true cage window around. Now the beauty of a cage window is it still gives off attraction on the way down. I'm a massive believer, particularly when it's cold, that the fish are off bottom. Skimmers, roach, whatever, they're swimming around off bottom. You've got to drag them down. So if you bomb all your bait straight to the bottom, you're not going to catch many fish because obviously the only way they're going to know it's down there is on the bottom. But with a cage window, getting a little, I'm losing a little bit of ground bait on the surface, a little bit on the way down. But all that scent in the water, fish f smell the scent, they see the cloud and they follow it down. So. That's why I love the cage window. The other big advantage when it's shallow is minimal disturbance. They're going very quietly. If it's only like four foot, five foot deep as it is today, what I don't want is a, a massive feeder going produce on top of them. Water's clear, it's cold. The fish aren't really hungry. They're not coming to noise. I mean, they will come to a bit of bait and they will feed as I've sort of already shown, but I need to sneak that feeder in. And that's the reason I've started on the small cage window and later on I might even go down to the extra small. You know what I mean? Basically it's a case of chopping and changing. Uh, weight wise, obviously it's got the exchange system so I can just clip them on and off. I've started on 20 gram, purely 20 grams a little bit tricky in this wind but it's a case of making as little disturbance as possible. So at the, at the moment I've been fishing sort of seven to eight minute casts but if it sort of slows up and goes a bit quiet what I might do is switch to a medium a bit more bait be a little bit more patient sometimes people say oh the swim needs a rest there's different ways of resting it like one way i could rest it today is to put the bigger feeder on and have a 15 minute chuck bearing in mind i'm not fishing for lots of bites so a 15 minute chuck might produce a bite but it just allows the swim to settle there's minimal disturbance and then the next chuck back on the small feeder might result in a fish so it's just literally a case of chopping and changing feeder sizes taking into account what's happened what's happening i have got obviously some slim lines with me as well but at the minute for, for how i fish i just love a cage window something else that i'll probably do later on is slot my ground bait up a cage window holds slot absolutely brilliantly there's nothing basically i can't do with a cage window so it's cage windows all the way as far as i'm concerned on the subject of slopping it up a little trick that I like to use a lot for this type of fishing is to create a cloud. Now the way to do this is to overweight your ground bait, at, get an atomizer, or if you haven't got an atomizer, obviously tub of water, just dunk your hand in it, but an atomizer makes it easier. Just overweight your ground bait so it turns into basically like a light slop, as in it wouldn't stay in any other feeder other than a cage window. And then what I'll have is maybe three two minute chucks with the slop in, I hopefully catch a fish, but if I don't, I've had three two minute chucks to cloud it up and then maybe I'll have an eight minute chuck with a slightly stiffer mix, go back to the original mix, just to try and catch one. But that slop can be absolutely deadly, particularly when nothing's happening. You feel there's no fish in the area, three two minute chucks with a slop and then one eight minute chuck with your original uh, mix and that'll often produce that extra little bite that you need at the end of the day. 
Something else I'm a massive fan of when I'm skimmer fishing is fishing what I call slack. Now, when I say slack, I don't mean a totally slack line so I can't see anything. It means fishing with a min minimal resistance or a minimal bend in the quiver tip. So maybe using light tips, like three quarter ounce or an ounce, or as light as possible on the day, and trying to keep that tip so it's just got that tiny little bit of bend on, in it. And the way I do it, an XL Reaper rest is perfect for this, is I literally keep moving the rod. I'll start at sort of two thirds of the way back down the Reaper, and then move my way to the front. All the time, I'm just trying to reduce the resistance and the reason I try to reduce the resistance is to stop fish bouncing themselves off. What you tend to find is if your tip's locked up in the toe, you'll get a very sharp indication and then nothing, or two sharp indications and nothing. And the reason is the fish has bounced itself off because of the excess tension. So by keeping it nice and slack and using a running rig, the bites are lovely and smooth and you miss less. And when you're only fishing for a handful of bites on a cold, hard day like today, hitting every bite is a massive advantage. If you're ever desperate for a bite in the last 20 minutes of a match, great little trick and one I use an awful lot, but I don't use it till very late. It's really important to say it. This isn't something I'd do three hours in, it's, and it's to go past my bait. When I say go past, I'll literally take a meter off. I take it from when my reel is to the first guide is about 50 centimeters. So I literally unclip, go one, two, so that's a meter, and then clip it back up, and I'm fishing at the back of my bait. And it's amazing how many times I'll get one fish there. But if you do it too early, you've got to let them fish, let the odd fish sort of build up confidence at the back of the bait. So if you do it too early, that fish isn't there or you might spook it. But by doing it sort of last chuck or last chuck but one, you'll often do it, put the rod down, and you'll get an instant response. So that fish has been there all day, just picking up the little bits off the feeder that are falling on the way down and landing behind where you've been fishing. But what you don't want to do is be doing it three hours in because then all of a sudden you're feeding bait past your initial feed and if anything, you're pushing the fish further away. A subject I've already talked about in this film is the impact of worms. Now, worms are that sort of Jekyll and Hyde bait for me, as in one day they were fantastic, the next day they're literally cyanide. But I've had several occasions where I've been a couple of hours in on different venues, chopped up some worms, not nice and fine, and had two quick chucks of them to get a bit of flavour and scent in the swim, and had an instant response. Sometimes you get a better response that way rather than putting them in at the start. So worms always in my armory, for, even when it's cold, but that impact can often be the best way of introducing them. Another great tip for this style of fishing is you need to read your swim. You need to take into account what you feel is happening under the water. Today is a brilliant example of that. I've had four quick fish over the initial feed and then it's literally switched off. Yes, it's got windy, but my gut instinct is I need to top it up. So two quick feeders, and I'm hoping for an instant response again afterwards. I'm trying to make it happen rather than waiting for it to happen. Well, the wind hasn't eased off. If anything, it's probably got a bit stronger, but I've just put those two feeders in. It just seemed like the fish responded really well to the initial baiting, and then it went quiet. Put two more bait ups in, both quite soft, and I've had an instant response. Not the biggest skimmer of the day, but a bite out of sort of nothing, probably gone for 45 minutes of nothing. And then a quick fish, which just goes to show that sometimes you have to sort of push it a bit, take into account what's happening, as in you got the response to the early bait. Just try, you don't have to add lots of bait, two feeders has been enough to get a response. And hopefully I'll have this fish, get back out, maybe get another one, and I might have to top it up again. But I quite, I quite like the sort of topping it up with a big feeder and then sneaking the little window in over the top, minimal disturbance, and catching the fish that come to the bait. A lovely Wuzpa hybrid, probably, I don't know, pound 12, maybe two pound. It's quite a chunky fish and a great example of having to work for your fish. It's really, really windy now if you haven't gathered. 
and I just felt with it being shallow, I needed a bit more traction around my hook bait. So I swapped to a 30 gram medium window, 30 gram to try and get through the wind a bit more. I chucked it in, so like a 10 second chuck, let it at the bottom, emptied it, chucked it straight on top, and literally 90 seconds later, this was the result. Proof if you needed it, that even on a cold, windy day, there are bites to be had, you just have to work for them.